Right, so Lindsay Hoyle, Speaker of the House of Commons, but for how much longer, given he exposed himself to having been allegedly open to coercion and blackmail for the sake of hanging on to his precious speakership, now facing an ever-growing list of MPs signing an early-day motion calling for a vote of no confidence in him. Keir Starmer was trapped by his own pro-Israel proclivities, was facing the largest Labour rebellion since the Iraq War, and Hoyle let him off after apparently being threatened with withdrawal of support by his own party, the Labour Party, to retain the Speaker's position upon resumption of Parliament following the general election expected later this year. Hoyle put himself first by putting Starmer's wishes above parliamentary convention, above parliamentary rules. That is unforgivable. For a Speaker to have been exposed as being too weak to stand up for his position against arguably the most corrupt Labour Party leadership ever means his position is untenable. He has lost the trust of the House. Nobody can ever trust him again to be even-handed or impartial. He's disgraced his position and an apology and an attempt to justification which nobody believes is going to save him, I don't think. Right, so if you've watched my other video on the shenanigans that went down on what was supposed to be the SNP's opposition day, you will know already that Speaker of the House of Commons, Lindsay Hoyle, allowed an amendment from Labour that, by convention, should never have been permitted. Do go and watch that to get all the gory details of how Parliament fell to rack and ruin last night, utterly failing to be a voice for the people, and becoming instead a vehicle to protect Keir Starmer from a rather tricky rebellion. Hoyle by his own selfish desires to remain in his post after the next general election, it is alleged, allowed himself to be blackmailed basically by Team Keith, who told him to break convention, sideline a House of Commons standing order, and allow Labour's amendment to the SNP Gaza ceasefire motion, or they wouldn't support him to return as Speaker, and he deed their votes to resume that position. It appears Hoyle bent, bent to Starmer's will. That in and of itself renders his position as SNP Westminster spokesman Stephen Flynn quite rightly stated, untenable. A speaker who can be coerced can never retain the trust of the House. He's not a Labour MP per se any longer. But if he's going to take orders from Starmer any time Starmer or the Labour whips choose to threaten him and his position, cannot remain in post, cannot hope to retain the trust, respect or order of the House of Commons. He ought to have resigned last night instead of coming up with a cock and bull excuse about protecting MPs. But because if you're the sort of MP who wants to see genocide in Gaza carry on, then frankly you deserve to be held to account for that in the most forceful terms. Though of course I will not condone any violence. Still, motions and amendments cannot and should not be brought primarily on whether or not it is safe for MPs to debate those matters because they happen to hold abhorrent views. If that is how things go, then no longer are they serving the will of the people in any way, shape or form, but only themselves. And this was the most blatant example of that. All of this was to save Starmer from a rebellion of his own MPs. All of this was to look after Keir Starmer. Exposing that more than possibly anything else that has come out is a statement from the clerk to the Commons. And even more hilariously, this was possible because of something Hoyle himself had instigated, insofar as he established a procedure whereby if the clerk felt any of Hoyle's decisions comprised a substantial breach of the long-established standing orders or conventions, that the clerk should make a note of any such view, with Hoyle undertaking to inform the House if he had done so. Well, Hoyle made good on his word here at least, because this is exactly what the clerk did. The full letter goes on a bit and is a little bit technical in places, but the standout line from it is, The procedural impact of the decision taken today is that the first division is likely to be on the official opposition's amendment rather than on the SNP's motion. And depending on the outcome of any such division, it is possible that the House will not be able to vote on the SNP motion nor on the government's alternative proposition. Sure, all debates are on the clock. An extra amendment that time had not been allowed for? That's a problem. If the amendment passed, that would have meant the SNP's motion would be amended before the SNP were even given a chance to present their motion. And given it's their opposition day, that's disgusting. Well, something would drop off as well. If, depending if the amendment, if the amendment didn't pass, for example, then the SNP may not have time to present their own motion either. So it's a double problem for the SNP. And as I said, it's their day. Why should Labour be allowed to do this? It could be the SNP's own motion on SNP Opposition Day not being heard. It's absurd. Hoyle allegedly had been told all of this and still went ahead. So good on the clerk for making public their concerns and demonstrating beyond doubt that what Hoyle did was out of order and why. Blackmailed by Labour 
abused convention by effectively ditching standing order number 31 to suit himself, has shown favouritism towards his party and bent the rules for Starmer, making a total sham of an order of business to acknowledge and vote to end the genocide against innocent Palestinian people in Gaza. Hoyle put himself first because Starmer was putting himself first. Well, he's now brought the weight of Parliament down on his head. Today, an early day motion has been brought for MPs to sign and support calling for a vote of no confidence in Hoyle. At time of writing, at least when I began writing, there were 33 signatures on this. By the time I finished and was getting ready to film, there were 59. A mixture of Tories and SNP signatories. And when they are both in agreement on something, you know it's got to be big because they bloody hate each other in Parliament. In a further break with convention, where the Speaker typically does not get challenged for their seat in the general election, the Tories are now considering standing a candidate against Hoyle, no less, in his seat of Chorley. And another slant on this story, which is being shouted about a bit less, is coming from some quarter certainly though, is Hoyle's recent trip to Israel last November, which some people might have noticed and remember, accompanied as he was by the rancid UK ambassador for Israel, no less, Zippy Hotavelli, looking at the sites allegedly struck by Hamas in Israel. Alleged because there's a great deal of evidence suggesting many of the fatalities and much of the damage caused there was from Israeli forces and not as a result of the incursion. This is all evidence that's still being gathered. This is a day in court still to come in future and a ruling to be made on that, of course. But as an impartial speaker, as the bloody speaker of the House of Commons, why was he even there? Starmer's actions were completely in keeping with his pro-Israel devotion too. So as much as we're being told Hoyle was coerced or blackmailed by some in the media, could it possibly have been a chummier chat about it in actuality? Of course, if he and Starmer think they might have saved Labour here, what they've actually done is expose the lengths they'll go to to stand up for Israel. They scuppered a legitimate ceasefire vote. They treated the people of Scotland and their voices as secondary to everyone else. And they also exposed Labour under Starmer to be a venal, weak, frightened, amoral, self-satisfied and self-interested entity, completely oblivious or completely dismissive of public opinion. And Starmer and co still have the brass neck to say they want to serve us. They have zero intention of serving us. They intend to rule us. And criticising Israel will become virtually impossible. They'll make sure of that. I'm certain of that. If these are the lengths they're going to now, that's a given. These are people with absolute contempt for us and total contempt for every dead Gazan, still leaving more for dead with no more of a care about them either. Labour under Starmer, it is no secret, utterly disgusts me. Hoyle, I've always thought, was a weak letdown of a speaker, making us long for the return of John Burko. But my opinion of Labour under Starmer is one of abject, visceral hatred now. They played politics. They stole an opposition day from the SNP. And they're doing nothing but gloating about it on social media today. Hoyle is far from the only one who needs to go now, because honestly, are you really going to vote for politicians who are grinning about what they've done here? What they did last night, bringing Parliament into complete disrepute? As I said at the beginning, there's more details on the ramifications, the actions and the allegations behind this story. What happened in the Commons last night, as well as specifically on Starmer and Labour's actions. Watch this video recommendation for all of that if you haven't already seen it. And I'll hopefully catch you on the next bit. Cheers, folks.